Welcome to the Qualified Tutor Podcast. I'm your host, Ludo Miller, and I'll be interviewing tutors and thought leaders from across the tutoring landscape to inspire, inform, and motivate you to become the best tutor you can be. The Qualified Tutor Community is a safe and supportive space for tutors who love to learn and grow. We offer training, resources, ideas, and a chance to connect with like-minded tutors. If you'd like to continue the conversation, join our Qualified Tutor Community at www.qualifiedtutorcommunity.org or find it in the show notes. Welcome to the next episode of the Qualified Tutor Podcast. We are delighted to be joined today by three guests on this roundtable podcast uh, where we will be discussing the role that tutors and agencies, schools and teachers can play to work together to bring the best result for students. Uh, We feel this roundtable format really brings the most out of the topics that we are discussing. Today we will be joined by uh, Tom Seddon, Johnny Manning, and Amy Welch. Tom is a class teacher and science lead at a primary school in West Yorkshire. Um, Tom is also uh, joining us for the current cohort of the Qualification for Tutors and we are very, very happy to have him with us. Johnny is uh, the wonderful director of uh, Manning's Tutors who work very closely with schools uh, and who uh, has been involved uh, very intimately with the conversations around the National Tutoring Programme. Uh, Amy is a head teacher at uh, Lambeth Academy in South London and has worked closely with, with Johnny and with Manning's tutors for the best part of 10 years um, and really is in a very good position to comment on the positive impact that one-to-one tutoring has and therefore how tutors can best be deployed in schools. So welcome to all three of our guests. We are, of course, also joined by uh, Julia Silva, the wonderful founder of Qualified Tutor, and it's great to have uh, this group here today. We always start with these warm-up questions, and listeners of our pod are beginning to see patterns in the answers. So I'm fascinated to see what you, Johnny, and Amy and Tom are going to, no, no pressure, are going to bring to answer these questions. Firstly, what kind of a student were you? And secondly, did you ever have a tutor? Johnny, will you kick us off? Sure. Um, I was probably a slightly annoying, overachieving student. Um, I, especially in maths, um, was kind of a year or two ahead of my class from primary school and sort of ended up taking my GCSE maths a year early. Um, but it was definitely in a setting where it wasn't sort of, um, sort of favorable to be academically smart. You know, it was difficult sort of having friends and, uh, you know, that whole sort of dichotomy of pupils if you can't work hard and be cool definitely applied in my school. So uh, it's slightly, you know, frustrating, um, especially, you know, getting older and having learned that in other schools, that's not the case. I kind of wish that I uh, had more opportunities sort of elsewhere, perhaps. Um, and no, I never, never had a tutor. In fact, I started tutoring when I was 15 uh, because of being... Um, yeah, so strong in maths. I started teaching one of my sisters, uh, who's four years younger than me, one of her friends. Uh, and then that went well, so I started teaching their neighbour, and then their neighbour's neighbour as well. So before I could even drive, this was down in, in, in Sussex. Uh, I think the first mum used to come and pick me up, the second mum would give me dinner, and the third mum would drive me back home again. So uh, like, as a 15-year-old, getting £10 an hour, I think it was. It was a pretty sweet gig. Um, <laughs> And yeah, so yeah, it's, uh, that was the beginning of tuition for me. Is when I moved to London, yeah, carried on tutoring right the way through university, and, and then set up the tuition agency. So I uh, never had a tutor, but yeah, um, that's what twenty odd years of, of tutoring now, uh, in one way or another. Fantastic! Thank you so much. That really kicked us off. Amy, go ahead. Um, I yeah, I would agree. I was really hard working. My dad was actually the head of the sixth form at the school that I went to, so I didn't really have a choice. Uh, otherwise, I always had to be on my uh, best behaviour. Um, I definitely tended to prefer subjects uh, like maths, where it's problem solving, and you always want. I always wanted to work to get a correct solution. I don't think I quite had the imagination for sort of English and some of the art subjects. Um, and in terms of tutoring, I did have a, an A level maths tutor actually. Um, 
to get some support um, with that and had a really good experience there just kind of helped with some of those more challenging topics um, I've done a little bit of tutoring in my time and it's really interesting because lots of people think being a teacher in front of a large class is a real challenge but I actually you know admire tutors that work to one-to-one -to -one because I think their challenges are very different but sort of equal that is fascinating. We can't wait to plumb that seam. That sounds like a really, really interesting line to go down. Let's hold on to that question about the difference between teaching and tutoring. Tom, go ahead. Okay, so I'll, I definitely continue the theme in that I, I will call myself a hard working student. I was definitely um, someone who um, we tried almost that little bit too hard and that little bit, you know, always trying to go the extra mile as it were. But, but I was definitely more of a an English philosophy ethics kind of student. Um, I was more uh, about the creative writing side than the, the maths and figures. Um, maths and figures was, was never my particular strong point, um, which is interesting actually, because now that I've gone into teaching, I, I'm glad to almost put more work into the, the maths and the, the science and, and the figures side. That's probably made me more of a fan of those now. Um, so my interest has probably changed, but that's only because um, who becoming a teacher. Uh, which has kind of made me think whether was it because I didn't like the subject because I wasn't good at it or was it because I was perhaps how I was taught on subject at school um, which you know who knows uh, and did I have a tutor so I didn't have a tutor uh, I benefited from mentoring programs um, when I was at secondary school so that was one which really sort of interest um, which was um, more around kind of career mentoring um, and again that was one-to-one -one. so whilst that wasn't based on maths and English tutoring and on my school subjects, I started to see the benefit of what one-to-one -one or small group tuition can have. Um, and that was what got me interested in education and it got me into teaching. Fantastic. So the benefits were really far reaching. Definitely. Fascinating. Absolutely fascinating. Thank you so much. I could keep going in those lines. But we have specific things that we want to talk about in this podcast, which is not usual for us because we do tend to like a good ramble. But let's see if we can really, really add value to the conversation in this in this uh, session. So the first thing that we wanted to ask you about was how do students benefit from tutoring in school and which students will benefit the most? And Amy, we thought we'd ask you first because you've had this opportunity to be deploying tutors, Manning's tutors, in your school and so you have a little bit of a track record and you're able to see a little bit of the impact over please give us a sense of how many years and how you've been using those tutors go ahead yeah so we've been using manning's tutors probably for about 10 years now the best part of 10 years maybe a few more um mainly in one-to-one -one or two-to-one settings um, but we've also been able to rely on manning's to provide us with some cover for teachers of, of larger groups where we've either not been able to recruit a teacher to continue on with a course but i'd say mainly one-to-one -one and two-to-one tutoring particularly with um, our pupil premium and disadvantaged students um Shall I talk about the benefits? Go ahead, yes. They're huge. <laughs> Um, so I, um, I think the first thing is that one-to-one -one attention definitely raises accountability for the students. Sometimes some of these students can get a bit lost in the classroom setting. However, when you're one-to-one -one or two-to-one, there's really no hiding from the content being taught. The student has to engage with it. And I think it's easy for the tutor to kind of check whether or not the students understand, um, as long as they're asking the right questions, in a way that sometimes students can opt out of that process in the classroom. Um, but although the challenge is probably greater for the students and the accountability, they also get the benefit of lots of support um, compared to a classroom setting. So there's opportunity for them to ask as many questions about the content as they like. They can take it at the right pace for them. The tutor can shape the explanation for the child and build up that relationship, working how the child, working out how the, how best the child likes to learn and make sure that they use that approach uh, moving forward. Um, one of the things that we found particularly useful is when we shared a question level analysis with um, Johnny's tutors. So you can identify the exact areas of weakness for that child and the tutor can focus in on those areas in a way that the classroom teacher might not always have time to give that individual 
individual attention um, and we've found that to be really useful because if you take that approach it's also easier to monitor the impact the tutoring's happening because I think far too often these interventions are put in place but nobody really has any way of telling whether or not it's having the impact that you hope it is. Um, and then I guess lastly, I just want to share that I think the benefits of tutoring go way beyond the one hour session itself. It can often give the child a newfound confidence, new motivation to then go on and carry out extra independent study sort of outside of both lessons and their tutoring time. And when the tutor shows that they believe in the child, the child often wants to do well for them in that development of the relationship. And I've definitely seen tutoring relationships develop into something more like a mentoring relationship, and there's real power in that. Uh, and then lastly, um, I think that the tutoring platform, that hour, it offers these students a chance to experience success. And these are often students that don't experience success in the classroom. And that can help them, again, have that greater belief um, in themselves, which can have wide reaching effects in terms of their academic and personal development, I'd say. Fantastic. I'm going to give you an extra lastly. When we chatted about this, Amy, you said something that really struck me. You said that they get the opportunity, the students, to associate effort with attainment. Because if they're lost in a classroom, they actually never get that opportunity to realise that if they apply themselves, they can be successful. Because if the pace is too fast in the classroom, or the pitch is off in that classroom, or they're distracted because it's not cool to be high achieving in that classroom, then, um, then that tutor can give them the opportunity to create that association. Absolutely. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Well, it was your thoughts, <laughs> but I really think that was up and ran with it because I'd never quite seen it before and that was really, really helpful. Johnny, give us your insights. Go ahead. Uh, uh, well, I was hoping Amy was going to stop talking because every single point that I wanted to make, she just kept on uh, giving it to me. Uh, I'm also going to ask Amy to rewrite our brochure because yes. she's... <laughs> Good luck, Tom, as well, following that up. <laughs> um, so succinctly there. Um, yeah, the, 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 the benefits, like Amy says, um, the, you do these QLAs and you see the, the, the elements that the class is struggling with and for a teacher they can look at it and go oh look there's this topic that everyone's struggling with I need to revisit that and that's completely fine but they might look and say oh look there's a topic that two pupils are struggling with I can't dedicate a class to teaching that and that's where that nuance of tuition can be really beneficial because we can then drill down into those topics with those individual pupils um, so yeah it's a it's a more flexible approach for a classroom teacher to, to make sure that you know, all of those gaps are, are being plugged. Um, and then, yeah, for the pupils, um, you've got this, this other voice. So that's what I quite often describe it as, because some schools we go into this, there's some resistance from teachers. Sometimes they say, well, why don't we just come in after school and do some extra sessions with the kids? They said, well, they've, they've already had you in the daytime in the classroom. Wouldn't it be nice if they got just a fresh perspective of it in the evening? And, you know, we, I mean, there are many different uh, companies out there doing lots of different things with tuition. Our speciality is using undergraduates, people who have been through the GCSEs and A-levels, yeah, in the recent few years and kind of see eye to eye with the people. They understand the stresses and strains they're under. They can relate to these pupils. And sometimes that can just make all the difference, you know, when... Um, they get that one-to-one -one opportunity um, and, and like Amy said, I mean our guidance to our tutors is, um, is to be reactive. They have a lesson plan just in case they're not getting anything out of the pupil but the main objective for them is to go in and say what did you do in school today or what have you been doing this week and yeah can you do that and generally the kid will say oh yeah I'm fine with that. We'll say, don't believe that for a second get them to show you and then you suddenly find out maybe they're not as confident on it as they, they claim they are. Um, and you can make sure that they're fully up to speed on that, whatever's being covered by the teacher that day or that week, um, before moving on to whatever you might have had planned for the lesson. And that means that that is the child that is going to be sat in the class with their hand up, contributing because they are they're with the program at that point. They've got that confidence. Like Amy said, then the benefit of this one hour of tuition just spills over and and, and multiplies upon itself, which is which is really. Really awesome. Johnny, tell us about those tests that you did, the weekly tests where you were looking at the same cohort. That was, yeah, that was a programme for what was then called Quint Quintum Kiniston in St John's Woods, um, where the entire year group, so 120 odd pupils, I think it was, was doing a GCSE maths mock every fortnight. 
Um, and what we did was we took those mocks home and marked them for the school overnight and produced a full QLA and said, look, here are, I think it was 30 pupils at first, but it went so well they expanded it to 40, um, who have made the least progress since the last mock. They haven't really moved on. Um, and we took those 40 pupils and we gave them half an hour of tuition every single day for the next two weeks. Uh, so we had some tutors that were in full time. They were sat in one place and just a new kid would arrive every half an hour. Um, these people didn't miss too much of the same lesson because it was like they came at 9.30 every day. So yeah, they missed a different subject every day. It wasn't too impactful. And what we did was we gave them the five topics that those people had struggled with that the rest of the class hadn't. Drilled them on those over the next two weeks. And then, yeah, we got this wonderful sort of controlled assessment because, or randomized control trial, because we had 40 kids we'd work with and another 80 that we hadn't worked with when they did the test. And I nervously took, yeah, got all the marks and looked at it. I was like, oh, please say our 40 did better. And every single time, I mean, there was sort of 50, 60, 70% more improvement from the pupils we'd worked with than the others, which was awesome. Um, but then I thought, oh, hang on a second, we're cheating here because we're just drilling them on five topics and they're walking back in and they're smashing those. Of course they improved. So I went into more granular detail as I yeah, want to do as a mathematician. Um, and I was checking, okay, are they just you know, getting those five topics this time? But because the school was setting a calculator paper followed by a non-calculator paper from the same series, the same topics that we were drilling them on weren't even coming up. So we were drilling them of things they weren't being tested on, and yet somehow they were still doing better. And from that, we kind of interpreted that just the confidence level was generally rising, that they were having a stab at the questions. And that was the, the, the qualitative feedback we got from the school as well. They said in the mock room, they could see the 40 that we'd been working with because they were the ones that were still there working, you know, as the hour and a half elapsed. So that was really awesome. That was a, a great sort of yeah, little study. Um, um, yeah, such positive results. Yeah, we should write that. That's brilliant. <laughs> Johnny, do you help? Uh, do you do anything for English as well, or is it just maths? Yeah, we do. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that was quite intense. We do all subjects. Uh, I mean, English and maths have historically been the highest demand subjects, especially when you know it was five A start to C's, including maths and English, that schools were judged on. In, it was such a binary pass or fail for a school to get a pupil from a D up to a C in maths or English, so that is where all the focus went. I think you know, we worked at Paddington Academy about eight, nine years ago where we were doing 100 hours a week and it was purely that CD board line. What I really liked about nine to one is seeing attention um, spread out across all subjects and all levels because it's just as valuable to get a pupil from an eight to a nine in geography um, Nowadays, or yeah, it's, I know it's still double weighted for maths and English, but yeah, it's it's a real boost to get people from that should be getting a nine that's sitting on an eight in any subject. So yeah, we've got two hundred forty tutors across all subjects, and um, really nice to get that attention to to, to all the all the pupils. Much broader view, isn't it? Fantastic, Tom. Can you talk to us about? the relationship between tutors and teachers, because we're anticipating that when the NTP tutors arrive in schools, one of the relationships that's going to have to be established and developed is partnerships between tutors and teachers, which is new for most schools. And with your teacher hat on and your tutor hat on, could you talk to us about how that dynamic might work in, in the crazy, constantly changing environment of a school? Sure, so what I think is there's gonna to have to be quite a big focus on developing trust between teachers and tutors, uh, especially in the early days. Um, I, I was thinking about this when we had um, the, the tutor training last week, and uh, it made me realize how one of the good things about having this almost uniform tutor training is that it's showing that there are, um, I suppose you could say, kind of like a, a, a agreed rules and you know agreed principles which all tutors agree to, um, and also that then reminded me of, of the teacher standards. But I think the difference is where the teacher standards everybody's heard of or has a good idea about. Perhaps with tutoring, the idea that all tutors, wherever they tutor, still buy into you know certain principles or values. Uh, that's perhaps not as quite clear communicated. Um, so what I think is to develop a successful partnership between 
tutors and teachers. It, it starts. It first starts with the tutor training um, and making tutors feel part of the, the whole school staff team um, rather than just an add-on. Um, and I think part of that will be making sure that their responsibilities are clear. Um, so again, I think the tutors will be a really useful um, resource for schools. Um, but then if those resources aren't used in the way they should, um, then there's a chance that they'll either just be a, an expensive um, you know, member of staff in the school not really contributing as, as, as much as hoped, um, or that could actually lead to perhaps tension between um, tutors and, and existing teachers uh, because they were thinking, mm, you know, what is my role, what is your role, kind of, you know, wh where, where do they merge a little bit? Um, and I think that with schools being so busy in September, um, with all the other things you'll have to deal with, um, making sure that all staff get on, um, including new staff who are tutors, um, is going to be really important. Um, and also, which I thought, the, the other part which just came to mind then, is the idea that um, it should almost be explained to existing staff, to teachers, um, what the tutors are there for. Um, so I think in lots of schools, and in my school, Guilty, this too, um, there'll be this big initiative which you're taking part in, but isn't always explained particularly well to all staff. Um, and what that means is um, there might be this example, a new tutor in school, but no one really knows what they're doing there. Um, and I think you, we need to kind of explain to teachers, you know, what is so good about tutoring, why the tutoring can help our school and our pupils, um, and actually you know, see the value in them being there, um, rather than just being someone else in the building. Um, and I think I think definitely based on the area where, where my school is, um, where generally um, there's a bit of misconception that tutoring is more for privileged children, if I should say, or that um, tutoring is something which only people who um, perhaps can afford tutoring, um, they can benefit from it. Um, and that's going to be something which I think schools are going to have to uh, kind of tackle that misconception um, to encourage, um, you know, not just children to participate, but parents to want their children to participate as well. Um, I think that's going to be another focus. Lots to do. Tom, you nailed it. Absolutely nailed it. Amy, could you respond? Yeah, I, I totally agree about that clarity of communication and everyone being really clear on what their purpose is. Um, I think I'd add really frequent contact between the tutor and the teacher just to make sure that there there's no um, overlap or should I say time wasted um, because time is going to be so precious. So being really clear about what the child has succeeded at and what topics should be covered next. Um, and I also think um, sort of joint observations work really well. So we had a tutor in our school recently that was teaching and um, I went in and observed them and gave them some feedback and for example whilst their subject knowledge was excellent they had less experience on the formative assessment side of things I, I have to say this wasn't a one-to-one -one, this was a, a small class so you know to be fair she straight out of university had no experience of teaching a whole class but she was so receptive and we got her using mini whiteboards so she was able to you know assess the un understanding of the whole class at once and it it really improved sort of the impact she was having and likewise inviting tutors in to observe in lessons so that they can see how it's done in the classroom setting and then if you've got that sort of mutual feedback relationship then hopefully nobody feels kind of threatened you can see that it's all just open and transparent and that, that sort of relationship is really positive. Yeah. Amy, this is new news to me because you're talking about building space within the tutor's timetable in school for them to do things other than working one-to-one -one in order to improve the impact of their one-to-one -one working. So if, if the school wanted to make use of that they'd act, actually have to leave space in the timetable and sort of discuss that with the agency wouldn't they? That's, yeah. that's quite an interesting and sort of uh, a longer view of how to make use of a tutor in a school. Yeah, I think, I think it's so important though that they're asking the right questions in terms of testing understanding um, and things like that. And if, if you're going to be investing in the tutoring, you want to make sure that it's having the greatest impact. Um, so I'm obviously not talking about taking a huge amount of time out, but, um, but yeah, I think it is, it is worth doing, doing properly if we're going to be doing it. Yes, and you mentioned earlier about, um, about testing and sort of impact data. 
who administers that? The teachers or the tutors or both? Um, so I would say it tends to be both and you, one of the sort of mi uh, middle or senior leaders would kind of do would have oversight of that to look at the sort of to track to on a topic by topic level and um, so unlike um, when Johnny was talking about them doing different sets of mock exams we would have almost more of a pre and a post assessment so you know we'd give them five topics they do an initial assessment based on those five topics and usually perform very poorly and then they'd have their block of tutoring and they'd do a post assessment so that you could really assess the impact particularly on those topics that have been covered. Fascinating. Um, Johnny, do you want to take it from here? Talking yeah, about establishing I mean, the partnerships between the agency and the school. Yeah, I mean, the closer that agencies yeah. and schools can work together, the, the better impact we're going to have for all the pupils involved in, in this school tuition relationship. Um, yeah, uh, Tom mentioned communication between teachers and, and the tutors. I think that is absolutely vital. Um, yeah, you, you do be resistant in some places where you just feel that the, it's like, oh, why is this agency coming? Why is this tutor coming in? And, you know, why do they think they can do it better? It's not a case of that. It's, it's like, let's unify, let's pull in the same direction. Um, so the, one of the key ways that we try and do that is to ask the individual teachers of the school, uh, the pupils, to list these five topics that the pupils are struggling with and to send them to us before the first lesson so that each tutor is walking in knowing exactly what that pupil was struggling with. Um, yeah, we've had mixed results with that. Sometimes uh, it comes through wonderfully. I mean, everything that I've done with Amy Garn has been, yeah, everything's been there because she's on top of it all. Sometimes we don't get it. Well, the most frustrating one is when someone just sends the same five topics for an entire class. And so, well, if those five topics are the ones that are struggling with, then you can do that in the class. Let's get this down to a granular level so that we can have the, the, the greatest impact here. Um, and you know, put that effort in and we'll all get more out of it as, as a result. Um, I think, like Amy says, pre-tests, post-tests, I even advocate for a sort of midway test if you can as well, if you're running a 10 or 12 week. I think MTP is sort of pushing for a 15 week program, um, which is wonderful because you could then do a partway test, say you had a cohort of 40 pupils doing yeah, uh, maths, 40 doing English, 40 doing science. If you did a partway test, it would give you the opportunity to look at it and say, oh look, these pupils are doing phenomenally well. In fact, they've, they've caught up, wonderful. Let's actually take them off the scheme and put some other pupils in that could benefit from it. Look, these pupils are doing pretty well. I think they could benefit with continuing to the end of the scheme. Or hang on, look, these pupils, yeah, they, they aren't benefiting from this for whatever reason. Let's identify why not. Are they in a three to one that they're slipping to the back of the group somehow or not engaging? Or um, is there an attendance issue or a, 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 a sort of a behavior issue going on? So if you, if you do that at the midway point, you have the opportunity to make sure that you use the second half of the program. Yeah to its greatest effect. Um, but yeah, like I said, the more collaboration we can get going between schools, SLT, teachers, tutors, and tutoring agencies, the better. So talk to us about your procedures. So Johnny and Amy, you talk to each other and then the teachers and the tutors talk to each other? Um, yes, but I, I'd say I'd t the, the, the member of the senior leadership team in charge would probably actually talk to all the stakeholders from the child to the tutor to um, Johnny. And I think just to build on what Johnny said, it, I think if an agency can really strip back what the, the sort of admin side of things I think that's really and I think that's one of the things that Johnny does really really well you know he that there's certain key bits of information that he needs and obviously we get that but all the other stuff he just takes out of our hands which you know when you're busy in the day-to-day -day running of a, of a school is so so helpful um yeah sorry I've got I forgot what the original question no, was. Hang on, and I actually wanted to nudge you even further in terms of um the agencies being really organized because we're going to have um, a whole conversation around bubbles and 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 all of the the the, the safeguarding procedures that are going to become part of our daily risk assessment. So, how are you going to be speaking to the agencies that you work with to make sure that they stay up to date with the way that you're doing things in your school? 
Yeah, that's a really interesting point. I mean, I'd I'd say the communication is really frequent and it's great to know you can just pick up the phone um, and have someone there to give you that um, give you that support. Um, in terms of all of the COVID-19 planning that's happening, um, there's a, obviously everyone in September will be spending part of their inset looking at what the new normal kind of looks like. Um, now, I I would want the sort of uh, leaders of the agencies, and I know Johnny would do this, if I sent him a briefing document and said, right, this is how we're doing things at Lambeth, and this is sort of what I need tutors to be aware of when they're coming into school, I, I know that they'd all get that message. Um, <laughs> Equally, I think in these sort of strange times, we might go a step further and do a mini induction for the tutors who were coming in. Obviously, there's different types. Obviously, if you've got the people working with you the whole time, that's slightly different. You treat them as a normal member of staff. But I think there's probably a place for having a, a more of a mini induction, particularly in that first session that says, look, this is this is the way things need to be. Yes, yes, and we're going to need to make those systems as smooth as possible so they don't take up too much of that valuable time, aren't we? Yeah. yeah. Fantastic. And now, a brief word from our founder, Julia Silver. If you'd like to hear more about the ideas we touch on here, or gain the tools to take your own tutoring to the next level, the qualification for tutors could be for you. This live online seminar is facilitated by industry experts who, over four Zoom workshops, will cover the foundations of teaching and learning and how it relates to you as a tutor. The workshops are full of rich discussions where you'll learn alongside other tutors and connect on a professional level. We will teach you how to be the kind of tutor every child remembers. Visit our community space at qualifiedtutorcommunity.org. And sign up now for our transformative course. We'll see you there. Tom, could you talk to us? Sorry, Ludo, go ahead. Um, yeah, I, I, I feel like it's, it's, it's very good for this conversation to, to, to kind of to move on to a conversation or discussion about the, the, the National Tutoring Programme itself. And it's great to hear, Amy, that that's real practical advice on how schools actually integrate or deploy tutors. Um, and I think that kind of conversation will become really much, much more um, important as the programme moves on and as more and more schools you know, uh, register and their interest and, and start kind of working towards how to do that. Um, so thank you very much for that. I think, Tom, I would love to ask you, how, how do you think we can ensure that the National Tutoring Programme works best for students themselves? Um, so I think we can make sure the national program works best for students in kind of seeing the, the program as part of the school's COVID recovery plan. So actually seeing you know, it is a really important part of it rather than just an add-on. Um, and what is quite encouraging when, when you see the information coming out about the, about the NTP um, is that um, there's so many, I feel there's big charity organisations kind of getting involved with that Teach First or the sort of trust. And, and I think those, by having those kind of big names on board, that will give um, um, lots of schools, especially in, in, in my area, kind of like uh, the confidence to, to use it and embed it within their COVID planning. Um, especially when, um, obviously for some of the tutoring, there, there will be a cost. Uh, and even though it, it is subsidized and schools will get some of their uh, COVID recovery, COVID recovery um, kind of catch up money, um, schools will still have to think carefully how, how they use that. Um, but I think definitely if the NTP feels you know, crucial to the school's recovery, that is really important. Um, and I think for my school, could we have a quite high number of pupil premium children? Um, and I think we've never really used tutoring um, to support the pupil premium children, or perhaps we never used it as well as we could. Um, and I hope that one of the things that, that just come out of the programme is the school has a, a new respect for tutoring um, and also um, you know we've I, I guess those teachers in school can almost you know, steal some of the the good ideas and practice tutors that they've been using for a while uh, in the same way they can also learn from teachers a bit of a two-way street um, one thing which, we, which I have noticed uh, especially during the the lockdown um, over the past few months um, different schools have 
but how they had different provisions for online teaching. Uh, some of them loaded it, some of them none at all. Um, and I found that as a profession, um, some of us were a little bit um, you know, unsure, or some of us were a little bit, weren't quite sure how to use online provision in the best way to support students. Um, and I think that's something which tutors have been doing for quite a while. Um, and I'm hoping that is something which we'll be able to, you know, magpie and improve, um, which we can use, you know, during the national tutoring programme. But also when when the program ends, we'll have a little legacy in our school. Yeah, I, I think that's that that, that two-way relationship that you've that you just talked about is really important. And I think you just touched on another great point there, which was that being in schools will mean that tutors get that same kind of staff from continuous learning that teachers uh, are able to get. So you know, tutors often are isolated. So that will be perhaps a real, a, a very positive side effect is that tutors are able to kind of be in that continuous learning environment that, that teachers benefit from. Um, Johnny, I would love to, to ask you really, just off the back of that, what do you think success would look like for, for the NTP? So, I mean, the initial success of the NTP is going to be, you know, just based on the pupils that are returning to school now having pretty much, you know, a lot of them had no education or limited education since, since March. Um, and I think we all know that there has been in that period of time a widening of the gap uh, between you know, disadvantaged pupils and their, their better off peers. Um, and there's some really interesting studies by Sutton Trust and the EF around just how much that's widened and how great the catch up would be, which is why it's awesome that, that, that NTP has come in and is hopefully going to help us to, to, to get those pupils that haven't been able to engage for whatever reason in the last six months back into education to get them back learning and, and, and make sure that this lockdown that this epidemic um doesn't have a long-lasting effect on their lives that they're able if they're in exam years to go on and get the results that they need to, to, to pass next summer um or you know even if they're year nine year ten pupils to to, to not be set back in such a detrimental way um that they, that they can't get what they deserve at the end of this um, I think what Tom said there, I mean, you know, you've got the more long lasting success of NTP, which is legacy. Um, I mean, we uh, supported, uh, counting it up the other day, um, 46 different schools and academies across London over the last um, 12 years, um, which, which is awesome. Um, and there's about 330 schools, uh, academies, or secondary schools and academies that we could work with. And I, don't think that there are that many of them that are actually using tutors as a complement to the study. So I'm hoping that NTP sort of awakens this idea of a collaboration between teaching and tutoring within schools, um, and that it can be seen as a so it could be, you know, another um, another string to the bow for education. Because I mean, part of my sales pitch sometimes to heads is to say, look, if you've got a spare 30,000 sitting around, you're not sure what to do with it, you could recruit one more teacher, but that's the teacher who is going to be able to teach one subject and they, you know, um, you're going to need them on the books all year round. Um, or you could take that 30,000 and have a much more nuanced approach. You could sort of focus on English in the first term and focus on maths in the second term and then just have a little look and see what you're struggling with in the run up to the exams and sort of, you know, have 10 different tutors in 10 different subjects suddenly coming in and giving that final push towards the exams. So it's a far more flexible um, way of providing education. So I'm hoping that idea, and that's from a purely <laughs> like, uh, um, selfish view as well, but I'm hoping that, that idea is embedded within schools that currently see it as you know, competition, which it, it shouldn't be. Um, and hopefully, yeah, I, I know Sutton Trust have been championing the idea of tuition vouchers for a number of years, and it's a, a scheme that hasn't sort of gone off the ground just yet, but this might be the, the catalyst for that to happen. So this idea that, you know, the widening of the gap is mostly happening because, um, you know, better off pupils have access to private tuition at home and disadvantaged pupils don't. So yeah, there's, only, there's two ways to solve that. Either you make private tuition illegal, so you stop the, dis, the, the, the better off kids having it, or you provide access to tuition for the disadvantaged pupils. It feels a bit like a nuclear arms race, doesn't it? It's like, uh, you guys got to stop having tuition or, or will have tuition over here. Um, so yes, yeah, so hopefully, you know, um, tuition is uh, verified as having the, the huge impacts that you know, the, the studies that the EF have done already. 
um, say that it does, um, and that in the future we can see tuition widen out so that everybody has access to it and all pupils are able to make the progress that they deserve um, yeah, across the board. That's, that's, that's success from, from my point of view. Yeah, yeah. I, I really think, like, uh, you know, if that's what it ends up looking like, then, then, <laughs> then it's, uh, there's been a, a, a real kind of positive step, hasn't it? Um, Julia, do you have thoughts on this? I do, of course I do. I've got tons. Um, but this is what I want to leave you with. Um, the question was, what would success look like for the NTP? And I think it's already been successful in raising our expectations of tutoring across the board. Because as soon as the National Tutoring Programme announced that tutor training was a eligibility criteria, what's happened is um, tutoring as a profession with professional development has arrived in the mainstream. And if it's necessary for the NTP, why would it not be necessary for the private sector and any other type of tutoring that, that we're offering? So what, what's happened is bigger than the NTP over here because as thought leaders, the EEF have been able to say, tutoring is so valuable that we're gonna invest in it. And in order to invest in it, we expect a certain industry standard, as Tom was saying before. And so, these tutor standards include a commitment to professional development. And so success for the NTP means, as Johnny said before, another string to the bow of education. Um, and that, that, that extends and overspills the boundaries of school. And it means that students are gonna have access to tutoring as another resource that's gonna enable their life outcomes. And if it is that the NTP can increase the supply of able tutors and therefore cause some sort of balance in the pricing which as we know at the moment pricing for tutors goes from five pounds an hour to 105 pounds an hour um, what we want to do is create an industry standard and having the ntp catalyze that is going to have a long-lasting legacy for the tuition ecosystem which we're really really happy to be a part of. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, and that's, uh, that's really the, the benefit of, of bringing together these conversations. Um, and you know, I, th this is certainly not the final time that we are going to talk about this. And I'm sure within one week, a lot of this stuff will be out of date. But um, <laughs> you know, I hope that, uh, you know, I hope that, that these, what we've discussed here are able to help a huge number of agencies, tutors, schools, uh, teachers, parents, you know, there, there's so many cogs, Tom, as you were saying, there's so many parts to this, but there's really, a, there's a lot to do, but we have to be speaking to as many of the, of the components of, of this program as we can. And I think what you three and Julia, you as well have been discussing there will really uh, bring a lot to, to, to help understand what peak it can benefit uh, and of course you know at this time being involved in communities being involved in in groups that that, that help with with feedback and with advice and with tricks and, and tips for tutoring even and for working in schools for example um, that's a really positive and and kind of a really useful uh, feature for for educators and, and especially in a time when everyone's working kind of online the QT community uh, goes some way to, to helping that. We have different groups for, for agency leaders. We have groups for um, uh, tutors uh, to, to share their tricks and tips. Uh, and really the conversation is already beginning to flow there. So um, the uh, link to join the community will be in the show notes below, but please do join it. You can find it at qualifiedtutorcommunity.org. Um, and really we, we, we welcome uh, all uh, tutors, educators, uh, agencies, teachers, as there is a space for everyone there. But we'd like to, to, to thank uh, everyone, uh, all three of you involved uh, today. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for finding time. Uh, as I said, we would love to have you on again. I won't ask you to confirm that now, because, but I know that uh, we, you will be very happy to join us again. So thank you very much, all three of you. Um, if you have any last thoughts, then please do, do add them now. But um, 
it's been a pleasure speaking to, to, to the three of you uh, and, uh, and we will see you again very soon. Thank you very much for inviting us. I really enjoyed it. Very insightful. Thank you, Johnny. Thank you, Amy. And thank you, Tom. Thanks for listening to the Qualified Tutor Podcast, where tutors share their expertise to support the tutoring community. If you'd like to continue the conversation, join our Qualified Tutor community at www.qualifiedtutorcommunity.org or find it in the show notes below. We exist to connect, share and learn with you because tutoring is a small job that makes a big difference.